I, I know some of you already have an interest in uh, understanding more about the sense of smell in birds, which I was really excited to, to hear. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, I won't be talking about toucans, but I cannot resist using the photograph of this beautiful bird here, um, primarily because of its association with the sense of smell. Many of us are familiar with the cartoon mascot for Fruit Loop cereal. Uh, you may remember uh, Toucan Sam. Um, I don't even know, maybe he's still around. I haven't seen cereal commercials in so long, uh, but his catchphrase was follow your nose. Uh, so you could find the delicious cereal, obviously. And I, I find it kind of um, interesting and ironic that our association with this phrase is a bird of all animals, because there is a longstanding myth that birds have little to no sense of smell. And that's where I'm going to start today. So the chemical senses, which include the sense of smell and the sense of taste, have been called the most ancient and universal senses. And that's because all life on earth has some kind of version of these senses. So for example, even bacteria can sense the chemicals in the environment around them. They have a behavior called chemotaxis, which just means that they change their movement in response to the chemicals around them. So if they sense a beneficial compound, they will move towards it. If they sense a harmful compound, they'll move away from it. Plants are able to communicate using chemicals. I actually really like this example in particular because it's a communication between different species. Uh, so this is a photograph of the tobacco plant. And there's a caterpillar called the tobacco hornworm that feeds on these plants. And of course, it's harmful to the plant to have its leaves chewed on. And they have evolved the system where when the uh, caterpillar chews on its leaves, the saliva of the caterpillar mixes with another chemical compound in the plant's leaves, and it releases this airborne scent that attracts yet another species, the big-eyed bug, which comes and eats the tobacco hornworm, which I think is a really cool example of cross-species communication using chemicals. Uh, thinking about vertebrate animals, uh, you're all probably familiar with the fact that um, salmon will all migrate in large numbers to their spawning grounds every breeding season. And the way that they find them is they release pheromones into the water. So these are chemicals that all the um, different, uh, all, all the individuals have, um, and it is released through their skin, and it's called an aggregation pheromone. And the way aggregation pheromones work is that the more animals that are together, the more of them are releasing the same pheromone. So it's, it's stronger where there's more animals and they're attracted to it. So that's what they're following. They're following the strongest concentration of that pheromone in the water to find where they're supposed to go. And then even closer to home, I think we're all very familiar with the idea that dogs have an excellent sense of smell and they're able to use it to find their way home over long distances, to find contraband in your luggage at the airport, or even in, when they're trained to do so, they can even detect cancer sometimes. So as you can see, this spans all levels, all different kinds of life on this planet. And it's a very fundamental sense, very important for sensing the world around you, keeping you safe, finding you food, communicating with others. And yet there's this idea that's been around for a long time that a major group of animals, birds, which are thousands of species, uh, completely lack this sense or have a very poor sense of it. So. Uh, despite all my work, um, if you look up olfaction in Wikipedia, you'll find this sentence, and I'll just read it. The importance and sensitivity of smell varies among different organisms. Most mammals have a good sense of smell, whereas most birds do not. And then they list a, a few um, well-accepted exceptions to this so-called rule. One thing I want to point out here is there's no citation, um, and that's because there's actually no scientific evidence ever that birds, that this is true, that birds don't have a sense of smell. Um, there's this idea has been passed down for a long time and people have, uh, it wasn't until fairly recently that there were a lot of studies on it. So um, when I first learned this, um, that this idea existed, I was baffled. I was still, I was still pretty new to studying birds. I hadn't heard that. And I really wanted to figure out where that idea came from because whenever I looked up scientific evidence for it, I couldn't find anything. Um, and so now I'm going to give you an extremely brief history of the study of avian olfaction, just to give you the, the highlights here. And uh, we did, this did come up before the meeting started. This idea can be traced to John James Audubon. Um, and this came out in a paper that he published in 1826 with the title, Account of the Habits of the Turkey Buzzard, particularly with the view of exploding the opinion generally entertained of its extraordinary power of smelling. 
I love titles like this to tell you exactly where the author is coming from. And so even back then, it was generally believed that turkey vultures, turkey buzzards, um, use their sense of smell to find food. And we see them all the time. If there's roadkill on the side of the road, you'll see vultures circling overhead and you think, oh, that's pretty far away. They must have smelled it. Um, and he didn't like that idea. And there's, this is not entirely his fault. There was a, a general idea that was pretty popular at the time that if you evolved um, a good sense in one area, so in this case, the idea is that uh, turkey vultures and many other animals, including other raptors, have excellent vision. They have very long distance vision. Uh, the idea was that there had to be some kind of evolutionary trade-off, that it wasn't possible for you to keep a good sense of smell and evolve a good sense of vision. Um, and so it was his idea that, it was his belief that um, because they had a good sense of vision, they could not possibly have a good sense of smell. And this idea was actually applied to humans as well. And if you've ever heard somebody say or, or thought yourself that, oh, we don't have as good a sense of smell compared to uh, compared to dogs, for example, uh, it's this, it actually dates to the same period and the idea that there was a trade-off evolutionarily speaking. Um, and so in this paper, Audubon did a series of actually very poorly planned experiments, which he believed showed that turkey vultures use their sense of vision, not their sense of smell, to find food. Um, and one example of these is he took a, a rotting pig carcass and he put it under some bushes and waited for the vultures to show up. And when they didn't, he said, well, look, they couldn't see it, and that's why they didn't come eat the, eat the pig. Therefore, they didn't use their sense of smell. But if you actually read the paper, he mentions that the vultures were circling overhead all day and that there were dogs attacking the carcass under the bush, which seems to be a pretty reasonable explanation for why um, the vultures did not come down to try to eat it. So uh, fast forward a bit to the 1960s and we have this classic study um, by Kenneth Steger. He, um, this was for his, his doctoral dissertation at University of Southern California, where he later became the uh, the bird curator in the uh, Museum of Natural History there. Uh, and he was aware of this debate. And um, this actually, yeah, Audubon's paper did spark several um, decades of amateur ornithologists trying to prove one way or the other that birds had, a, had or didn't have a sense of smell. Um, but he knew that, you know, it was generally accepted that turkey vultures did use their sense of smell to find food. And serendipitously, he happened to have a conversation with an engineer from the Union Oil Company um, who told him that they used vultures to find gas leaks in the natural gas lines. So if you've ever smelled natural gas, you know that it smells really bad. Um, but the fact is that actually natural gas is completely odorless and they add that odor. Uh, it's, a, it's a compound called ethyl mercaptan. They add that so that you can smell when there's a gas leak in your house because when you don't have that odor added, it can lead to you know, it fills up with gas and you have catastrophic explosions. It turns out that turkey vultures are attracted to the scent of ethyl mercaptan. It is the same odor that's given off by rotting flesh. Uh, and so this um, natural gas engineer knew that when they were looking for leaks in a, in a large gas line, they would find the vultures circling overhead. So Kenneth Steger set out to understand more about this and he um, devised a little device that would release ethyl mercaptan into the air and he tested it out. And sure enough, whenever that device was running, the vultures would come um, and respond to it. And they would be circling overhead for hours until his device ran out of the compound. So it's generally pretty accepted that yes, turkey vultures have a good sense of smell um, and they use it to find food. Uh, another widely accepted exception to the rule uh, is the seabirds, the tube-nosed seabirds or Procellariaformes. I like this beautiful albatross here. Um, and these are birds that migrate and, and search for food over hundreds and hundreds of miles of open water. And the way that they find food is that it is, is through smell. Um, and it's actually not the scent of the fish and the squid that they're eating that they are responding to. They are detecting um, a compound called dimethyl sulfide. And this is a compound that's given off when there are large assemblages of phytoplankton in the water. And so wherever you have a lot of phytoplankton, you will have fish and squid and the whole food chain will be there. And that is where the albatross and other birds will show up um, and find their prey items. Um, one of the reasons that people are readily accepted the idea that these birds use their sense of smell is because of the shape of their noses. It's not very obvious in this particular photograph, but 
Um, they're called the tube nose seabirds because they can actually see what looks like tubes on the sides of their nose. They have these long nostrils basically going back into their head from there. So seabirds were um, one of the first places where people started to look at whether they were using odor in social contexts. And the first study to look at this um, was looking at crested auklets, which are these adorable little Arctic seabirds uh, pictured here. They um, smell, they give off a smell of um, very tangerine-like odor when they're in the breeding, when they're in breeding condition. And Ian Jones and then later Julie Hagelin were interested in why they smelled like that and whether it was important to them socially speaking. And when two crested auklets meet in the breeding season, they do this very cool behavior called the rough sniff. And you can see these two birds doing it here. And what it is, is they will go up to each other and they will put their beaks right into the feathers at the nape of the neck. And it looks like they're taking a big sniff of the odor there. Interestingly, that is where uh, the odor, that tangerine-like odor is the strongest on the bird. That's that part of the body. So it does seem to be an important part of their social interactions. Another study of a different seabird, uh, various species of petrels, which are um, diving birds that primarily uh, breed in the southern oceans. Uh, these, some of these species are nocturnal and they breed in, um, I'm sorry, they're not nocturnal. They come back to their burrows at night and they breed in these large colonial groups. So there's hundreds and if not thousands of birds all in the same small area. And they actually burrow underground to lay their eggs and, and uh, hatch their eggs. And so they're out all day over the water looking for food. And then they come back at night in the dark where there's hundreds of burrows and they have to find the right one. And it turns out that they are able to identify their own burrow just based on the scent. So this was one of the first studies testing this by uh, Francesco Bonadonna and his group. And what they did was they would capture a bird, put it in a box, and there would be tubes from the box, one going to the bird's own burrow, which they had already figured out, and one going to a different burrow. And it turns out that these birds were able to choose the right one based only on the smell, they had no other cues. So these are bird groups that, again, were pretty generally accepted. You, even in that Wikipedia article, you see them listed as an exception to the rule. Um, but what about songbirds? You know, do they use their sense of smell? These are, um, you know, Passeriformes is the largest group of birds. It's about half of all living birds. Um, we see them all the time. Uh, they are, um, we, let, we tend to think of them as relying on their vision and their hearing because many of them are brightly colored. They have flashy signals to each other. They sing, it's in the name there. Um, and it's, they were very, people are very ready to, to write off their sense of smell. In fact, when I first learned the idea that birds had no sense of smell, it was a, a neurobiologist at Indiana University. And he studied um, how birds, you know, some neural brain stuff in the birds. And he told me that, the olfactory bulb in the brain, which processes the uh, information from the nose, is so small in songbirds that when he's dissecting brains for his studies, he just throws that part of the brain away. Um, and I, I was appalled. I didn't uh, understand why that would be. So that's what got me interested in studying this. Um, and so we do know that songbirds, like all animals, do produce odors. Uh, and the primary source of odors in most birds is prenoil secreted from the uropygial gland. And you can see the gland here on this uh, crossbill. Uh, this is the largest exocrine gland on most birds. Uh, and it secretes this oil that is called prenoil because while birds are preening, they reach back with their bills, they take some of the oil and they spread it on their feathers while preening. The oil helps protect the feathers from exposure to the environment, from UV light and weather. It helps waterproof them. Uh, it helps with thermoregulation. It helps protect them from ectoparasites. Uh, and it also gives off volatile or airborne compounds that give the bird its odor. So this was a, a reasonable place to start uh, learning about the odors they produce and what they might be used for. So next I wanna introduce you very briefly to the method that we use to study smells. You can't see smells, you can't hold them. Um, so what you have to do is you have to analyze the air that has the smell in it. And we do this with a method called gas chromatography mass spectrometry. So uh, here we have two different um, GCMS for short uh, results. On the top is uh, the GCMS results for preen oil from a gray cat bird, which you can see on the left. And on the bottom are the results from a northern cardinal, which you can see on the right. 
And the way this works, so chromatography is just a, a way to separate out the different compounds in the mixture. You can do it with gases, you can do it with liquids, um, and it separates them on the basis of size. And the mass spectrometry is a separate process that uses um, lasers basically to um, measure the mass of the, of the molecules that are being separated out. And that helps you identify what they are. Um, so here, if you look at this graph, um, along the bottom here, these are minutes. So what's happening here is you're taking the, um, the gas, in this case, the gas that's coming off of preen oil and you're pushing it through a tube and the smaller molecules will go through more quickly. So we'll see the five minutes, 10 minutes, et cetera. And the larger molecules will take longer to go through this tiny tube. So here at the end of the spectrum, we have you know, up to an hour on this graph. And then on the y-axis is a measure of abundance. It's just telling you how strong the concentration of that compound is. So comparing these two, uh, there are some similarities. There's some peaks that are the same in both species, but there's also a very different pattern here, right? So you can see here in the on the top with the catbird, there's a lot more compounds here than what we see in the cardinal. And what we found when looking across many different species is that there are species specific blends of compounds that each member of that species will have and that you can identify different species um, on the basis of the odor that they give off. All right, I'll be talking mostly today about my work in dark-eyed juncos, um, which are a widespread North American sparrow that breeds primarily at high latitudes, like up in uh, Northern Canada and high altitudes, like in the Rocky Mountains and the Appalachian Mountains. Um, they are very interesting species to study for a number of reasons. Um, one being that they're very um, normal in a lot of ways. They have a lot in common with many of our backyard birds. And so what we learn from juncos can tell us a lot about lots of different kinds of birds. Um, but also in the last 10,000 years, since the last glaciation, they diverged very quick, very quickly into a number of different subspecies, which you can see mapped out here and some photographs here on the left of the different subspecies I've worked with. Um, primarily, I've worked with a slate-colored junco at a research station called Mountain Lake Biological Station in Virginia, uh, and the Oregon junco, which I'm lucky enough to have in my backyard right now, but I actually have done a study with them in Southern California. Okay, so um, the reason I started studying juncos, well, first of all, it was because I had just gotten a postdoc at Indiana Univer University working in a lab with Dr. Ellen Ketterson, um, who has been doing a long-term study of these birds since the 1980s. And so I was searching for what was my topic going to be when we studied these birds. And just before I joined this lab, uh, one of the grad students had done a little project looking at preen oil. So juncos are ground nesters. Here's a photograph of a junco nest. And so when you're actually out looking for their nests in, you know, in Virginia, for example, you'll be looking just under a tuft of grass and there it is, right? It's actually pretty easy to find and they suffer from pretty high predation rates on their eggs from snakes, raptors, rodents, uh, et cetera. And so they were interested in um, a study that had come out a couple years before uh, looking at shorebirds like this red knot, where the researcher had discovered that these birds change the composition of their preen oil, or actually we call them preen waxes here. They're a little bit different because they are uh, water birds. Um, when these birds are nesting, they, they, their preen oil undergoes a, a chemical change. And so they switch from monoester preen waxes to diester preen waxes. Now the chemistry of that doesn't matter too much right now, but what's important is that the diester preen waxes, what they switch to when they're sitting on nests is much harder for predators to detect. And this is a fun study here that I'm citing um, where they actually used a dog that was trained to find the nests of these birds. And the dogs were not able to find them as easily when they had, um, after they had undergone this change. So the idea is that, okay, they want to become camouflaged you know, odor-wise, right, when they're, when they're nesting so that predators won't find their eggs. And so the grad student, Sarah Schrock, in this lab was interested in whether or not juncos did the same thing. So she teamed up with um, Helena Sawini and Milos Novotny, who are chemists at Indiana University. And they hypothesized that preen oil would be less smelly, it would have you know, smaller concentrations of these compounds during the breeding season so that it would help camouflage their nests from predators. Their results showed the exact opposite thing. So here we've got a set of linear alcohols, which are present in junco preen oil. 
and then um, along the y-axis is their concentration. The green bars are males in breeding condition and the blue bars are males in non-breeding condition. We saw a similar result in females. Um, and what you should notice right away is they're producing way more of these compounds when they're in breeding condition than when they're not in breeding condition. Um, so this hypothesis was not supported, but this result really caught my eye. I'm like, oh, that's very interesting. They make a lot of smells during breeding season. I wonder if these are important in mate choice. And so that is pretty much where my, my current scientific career began was investigating that question. So today I'm going to kind of do a broad overview of my research and the research of several other people uh, looking specifically at how songbirds use odor in social contexts. And specifically, most of us have focused on uh, mating, uh, fighting, and raising offspring. So we will start with the question of how, whether and how <laughs> birds use odor to find mates. So here's that same graph, right? These are males producing tons of th these odors when they're in breeding condition. That immediately brings to the thought to mind, I wonder if they're using this to attract females, right? We know male songbirds, many of them, um, they sing songs to, to get females, to attract females. They have brightly colored feathers or other ornaments that attract females. Uh, maybe odor is being used in the same way. Um, I want to point out, though, that we're not specifically talking about a pheromone. Uh, so here on the right is a cartoon of moth pheromones, one of the best understood pheromones. Uh, so female moths, when they are ready to breed, they give off a chemical compound that attracts males, and the males will come right to it. What makes a pheromone different from what we're talking about is that it's a single compound that every member of the species gives off exactly the same compound. So all female moths of the same species give off the same pheromone and it, it, it elicits a specific response in the receivers of that, um, of that chemical. So the males are pretty much powerless to resist, right? They will go towards that pheromone. What we're talking about here is um, more what you would call a signature mixture. So there's variation among individuals. It doesn't elicit a specific behavioral response that anybody's been able to determine in those who receive it. And it conveys information about that individual, as I'll show you. So in a lot of ways, it's a better analog for bird song uh, than for insect pheromones. So I did show you um, a drawing of a Y maze earlier in that first study of petrels finding their burrows. Um, but this is something called a Y maze, um, which I think it's obvious why we call it that. It's shaped like a Y. So when we want to understand um, how birds are, are, are um, responding to odor, what they can tell the difference between, what they prefer, um, we use these kinds of apparatuses. And so what you do is uh, we built this out of plexiglass and you take the two things you want the bird to choose between. So in this case, we had odor, we had preen oil that we put on cotton balls, one on each end, and then you put the bird in the middle, so down here, um, and then you leave the room so you don't bother them, and then you, you videotape them to see which side they choose to spend more time in. And so in this case, um, if we're interested in the question of, uh, is odor used to attract mates? Um, we took birds in breeding condition and gave them the choice between the scent of another male or scent of another female. Oh, and here you can see this is still from one of the videos. I don't know if you can make out the junko there in arm number two. And so um, that's what we did. And we measured the time that we spent. And the answer is, well, maybe not. Right. So here we've got uh, males on the left, females on the right. Those are the subjects. And then the blue bars are as male preen oil, time spent with male preen oil. And the pink bars is time spent with female preen oil. And then, of course, you know, that's uh, seconds in general. Um, you can see the males vastly preferred to go towards the arm that had male preen oil. And females, uh, slight preference, but not significant for male preen oil. So this does not appear to be involved in mate attraction. There's something else going on here, but they... The males in particular could certainly tell the difference between male preen oil and female preen oil, and they showed a preference here. One thing I want to point out is that using something like this to test mate choice or mate preference is a little bit sketchy because they're not choosing between two birds, right? They're, they're choosing between two smelly cotton balls, and context really matters. This was not, you know, a male who was courting somebody, right? They were, they were just put in this weird cage. Uh, for a little while. So that'll come up again. Um, so I think if 
Odor is used in mate choice in, in birds. Uh, it's not in the context of attraction. It's not like a pheromone. Instead, it's more of a bit of information about that bird who's giving off the odor. Um, and one of the most promising areas of research here is something called the major histocompatibility complex or MHC for short. Um, this is a gene family that all vertebrates have. Uh, and it's a very, it's called a complex for a reason. Um, these are the same genes that are involved in your body's deciding whether or not to accept an organ transplant. So that's actually where the word histocompatibility is referring to there. Um, and so what it does is it helps your immune system determine whether something is you or not you. Um, and so that, that is the part of your immune system that determines whether a pathogen has entered your body and whether or not it should mount defenses against it. And so the idea here is that this could be very important in mate choice. And this has been shown across a lot of different species, including humans, uh, suggesting that we are attracted to people that have different MHC genotype from ourselves. So each one of us has many, many copies of MHC in our body, and they're not all the same, right? So each um, copy is a little bit different, and that makes us, allows us to um, create a little bit different sets of proteins that will then help our bodies identify a greater variety of pathogens. So the idea here is if you mate with somebody who has different MHC genes from your own, you will each give a portion of those to your offspring and thereby ensuring that they have a diverse MHC genotype and that gives them a stronger immune system and ability, better ability to fight more diseases. And there is some evidence for this uh, in, across a lot of different species. Uh, most recently, this has been looked at in birds in, um, in song sparrows in the McDougal Shackleton lab at uh, Western University in London, Ontario. So here on the left is uh, uh, from a paper by Joel Slade, who later became my postdoc for a few years at Michigan State, um, looking at whether prene oil odor reflected MHC genotype. And what he did was he took pairs of birds and measured the distance between their odors and the distance between their genotypes. And he found a positive correlation. So the more different two birds were at their MHC genotype, the more different they were at their odor. And then a couple years later in the same lab, Leanne Greaves followed up on this with uh, some behavioral studies using the same kind of Y maze I showed you a minute ago, um, showing that song sparrows, when given the choice, preferred preen oil scent from MHC dissimilar opposite sex birds. So this upholds this idea that they would be more interested in uh, birds who had different MHC from their own. So this uh, um, odor might be important in mate assessment, choosing the right mate rather than mate attraction, just saying, hey, I'm available to mate. Uh, however, um, we were we were kind of male focused a minute ago, and that's a thing that tends to happen, especially when you study birds, because you've got bright flashy males and quiet brown females, right? But what we've discovered is that across pretty much all birds that we've studied so far, females produce stronger concentrations of these compounds than males do. Um, and so one of my early studies, I was trying to understand the shift from um, non-breeding to breeding and, so, uh, and how that affected the volatile compounds in the preen oil. And so I was at Mountain Lake in, uh, this would have been April, and that is a month when the birds are all starting, they've just migrated back to their breeding grounds, they're undergoing a lot of hormonal changes, um, the females are starting to ovulate, the males are singing, they're building nests, they're, they're claiming territories, they're getting ready to mate. And so what I did was I measured uh, the volatile compounds in their preen oil across four weeks of that early breeding season. And in males, I saw just a steady incline, pretty much as you would expect, right? Their, their testosterone is increasing as time goes on. So is their odor, okay. In females, I saw a different pattern. Um, so here, this is weeks one, two, three, and four. And here I'm sort of showing you a set of, these are actually methyl ketones that um, are found in higher uh, amounts in females than they are in males. And that's just the, tracking the uh, concentration across these four weeks. So no difference between week one and two, and then a sudden jump in week three, followed by a slight drop off. And I looked at that and I thought, well, that's a weird pattern. What the heck was going on in the population in week three? And so I went back to all of our logs from the season and I discovered that week three is when most of the females in the population were laying eggs. Uh, so 
Females typically they'll lay an egg one to two days after mating, so after fertilizing that egg. So they would want to. Um, so what 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 this suggests here is that they are giving off a stronger signal signal around the time that they need to fertilize their eggs. So this might be functioning as reproductive advertisement, not by males, but by females. And as you can see, the timing would really matter. So that might be something we would not have captured in our. And this could be important um, for its effects on the males. So this is from a study on chickens where they took roosters and they gave them the opportunity to mate with two females. Um, one female had, was normal, had her normal uropygial gland, and the other female had had her uropygial gland experimentally removed. Um, and what they found was that the males were less likely to try to mate with the females who had had that gland removed. So that's the UGX, so uropygial gland X. Um, you can see they copulated with uh, or attempted to copulate with females who had their glands intact much more frequently. And this leads to the hypothesis that um, these odors are important for um, stimulating male, be male mating behavior. So this suggests maybe you know, they actually have a physiological response to these odors. Maybe it increases their testosterone. That's all untested for, for now, but it's a nice uh, little flip of perspective um, from when we started out thinking just about males attracting females. Okay, so I'm gonna move on from mating to think about another way that birds interact with each other and that's fighting. Um, and odor can be really important for birds to assess potential rivals. So I wanna go back to another one of these mate choice trials. And again, remember I mentioned that you're not always measuring what you think you are because this is kind of an unusual situation to put a bird in. Uh, so this is a study by Louisa Ammo and her group um, looking at house finches. And they were doing this similar type of study to what I did, but they improved on it uh, quite a bit. So what they did, instead of just putting cotton balls with preen oil on it, they have whole birds in cages um, for the central bird to uh, choose from. What they did was these, um, these chambers that the birds are in, so one male on one end, a female on the other end, uh, they're, they're darkened chambers. Um, the, the male, um, in the center, he can't see them, he can't hear them um, because they're not really doing anything in the dark. All he can do is smell them, but he's getting whole body odor from live birds. And so similar idea, they put a male in the central chamber and give them opportunity to choose one side or the other. Here again, they're thinking, well, if this is, you know, if this is a uh, mate choice, if he's interested, if he's attracted to female odor, um, then he'll go to the female side of the cage. Well, what they found was uh, pretty confusing at first. Uh, they found pretty much half and half. Half the birds went to the male side, half the birds went to the female side. And I really enjoy this paper because they, you know, they went back to their data to try to understand what happened and they demonstrated something completely different. So what they found, um, they went back to uh, the odor donors. So this donor male here, he's, he's a donor, right? Um, and compared them to the focal males in each trial. And they measured, uh, they, put, they put together, calculated a quality score using a bunch of different measurements, including body condition, um, immune response, and feather coloration, all of which can indicate you know, the, the health of a bird. And what they found was when the focal male, this guy in the middle, was in worse condition than the donor male on the right, he instead chose to go to the side with the female in it. If the focal male was in better condition than the donor male, then he would go to the male side of the cage. Okay, which suggests that these odors might be important in sizing up a rival. Like, oh, I'm in better shape than this guy. I can take him versus mm, I'm going to stay away from him. I'm going to go hang out with this chick over here, right? So it's it could be um, a very different context from mate choice. So my colleague, Kim Rossfall and I, uh, followed up on this a few years later. So Kim Rossfall studies aggression in birds, um, and she's actually particularly interested in aggression in female birds. Um, and we looked at uh, aggressive behavior and um, 
an odor, a prenoil odor in wild juncos. And so what we used was a trial called a simulated territorial intrusion or STI for short. And basically you take a, a captive bird in a small cage and you take it out and you, uh, you take the cage to the center of a wild bird's territory. You set it on the ground and then you set up a speaker next to it and you play junko song. And this usually enrages the birds who live on that territory and they come out because they've got an intruder and they need to chase them away. And they will be, they will react very aggressively towards the bird in the cage who is safe because he's in the cage. And uh, one of the behaviors that we measure is called a flyover. It's just this aggressive swoop over the cage. Um, we took a bunch of behavioral measurements and we also had taken prenoil, took prenoil from these birds right after uh, and uh, measured a number of different things. So this is a composite score um, on the left. The details don't matter too much, but what you can see is that there's a strong positive correlation in males between their odor and how aggressive they were. So the more flyovers, the more aggressive and the higher of the odor score they have. We have also found a, a significant correlation in females, although it went in the other direction, which was interesting. So there's some other information there, males versus females. But the takeaway is that um, not only is it telling you something about condition, as we saw in the house finch study, but it can actually tell you how aggressive these birds are. And that's related to their testosterone, their circulating testosterone levels, but also their expression of androgen receptors in the preen gland, which will um, tell you how sensitive that tissue is um, to the testosterone and um, the more sensitive they are, the, the more of a, a response you'll see. Oh, yeah. So, okay. And then the third area I want to talk about is the importance of odor in recognizing your relatives. Uh, and that matters in a number of different contexts. So first of all, it matters um, to parents and, and their very young offspring, make sure they're taking care of their own offspring. Uh, and we know that parents and nestlings in every species that this has been measured in are able to recognize each other by smell alone. So this is another species of petrels, but another one that Francesco Bonadonna um, studied. So remember, he had the study showing they could recognize the scent of their burrow. Um, they also recognize the scent of their chicks. There's a wonderfully fluffy petrel chick here in their burrow. Um, and the chicks also recognize the scent of their nests, which is great. Uh, zebra finches uh, are able to do the same thing. So we know that um, zebra finch parents recognize the scent of their nest and zebra finch chicks recognize the scent of their parents. Interestingly, um, this is still true even if you cross foster them um, either after they're hatched or even before. So cross fostering is basically you just you have two nests that are about the same age and you can take eggs from one and switch it with the other so that they're raised by someone who's not related to you. Um, those are used in studies trying to understand basically the difference between uh, genetics and the way they were raised. You know, it's a genetics versus environment. Um, if you do that, um, the chicks still recognize the scent of their parents. And they know this by um, when the chicks are brand new, giving them a scent and they will beg more uh, intensely. Sorry, I'm a little mushy mouth today. They'll beg more towards the scent of their genetic parent than they will towards the scent of a, another bird. Um, so this is true even when you switch the eggs before they hatch, uh, because birds start learning scent when they're still in the egg. And this is a study by Julie Hagelin looking at chickens, and she presented, um, she, she put eggs, chicken eggs in with an odor for uh, some period of time. Um, and then after those chicks hatch, she presented them with that odor versus another one. It's a, a sent a, a test called a dishabituation test. And she found that they recognized the sense that they had been presented with when they were still in the egg. So eggs are permeable, air can pass through, they start learning those scents right away. And this is um, becomes important even when they're adults, they're able to distinguish between kin and non-kin, even if they've never met them, just on the basis of smell. This becomes really important when you're choosing a mate. Uh, it's fairly universal across most animals that uh, they try to avoid mating with close relatives uh, so that they avoid inbreeding depression, which is when two animals who are too similar to each other who have uh, very similar genomes mate with each other and it increases the likelihood that uh, a recessive gene that's harmful will be expressed. Um, 
And so back to our petrels, we know that uh, European storm petrels pictured here prefer the odor of unrelated adults when given the choice in, again, a Y maze. Oh, and this picture is great here. This is a, a you can see the tube nose here. You can see the tube on the on top of his beak. So that's why they're called that. Um, coming back to our zebra finches, uh, the Casper's lab, um, who had also studied zebra finch uh, nestlings, looked at um, whether females would mate when they were, uh, would mate with brothers when their sense of smell was blocked. So what they did um, was they took zebra finches, captive zebra, zebra finches, and they housed them in triplets. So it would be one female and two males. One of the males would be unrelated to her. And the other male would be an unfamiliar brother. So he would have come from a different clutch of eggs than she did. Uh, and then half of those females, um, they're, they retain their normal sense of smell. And the other half of the females, they uh, treated them by putting a, a zinc wash on their in their nostrils. Um, and what that does is it affects the mucosal lining of the, of the nostrils there and it um, temporarily blocks their sense of smell. And so they hypothesized that if the females didn't have their functional sense of smell, then they would be just as likely to mate with a brother as the unrelated bird. Whereas if they had their sense of smell, they would avoid mating with a brother and instead mate with the unrelated male. And this is another interesting case of the study not going according to plan. Um, so Yes, this hypothesis was supported to a degree. Um, what we've got here is the different stages of breeding. So we've got you know, triplet maintenance, we, you know, staying together socially, laying eggs, um, hatching the eggs, and then fledging. The females who could not smell were much more successful at um, reproducing than the females who could smell. So you can see that fewer females who had their sense of smell here in black succeeded at each stage than females who didn't have their a functioning sense of smell. But the reason for this um, is because uh, there was a lot of aggression going on in the cages or in the enclosures that had the females that could smell to the point where they had to remove some of the males because they had gotten attacked so badly. Um, these attacks were happening during the night, so they didn't actually observe it. But what they believe happened is that the females who were able to smell and knew they were caged with a brother were attacking the males so that they avoided mating altogether. Uh, so basically they, they sensed danger and they didn't want to breed at all. And, and that's how they handled it. Okay, so birds can um, recognize relatives by their scent. Uh, I was, was interested in understanding why they smell alike. So what is the source of the odor? Is it based on their genetics or is it based on something else? And that something else um, that I'll be talking about is bacteria. So we know that odor in mammals, many mammals, including ourselves, is actually produced by symbiotic bacteria that live in your scent glands. Uh, we, at the time, didn't know whether that was true in birds as well. And so I teamed up with a microbiologist, Kevin Tice, to conduct the study looking at families of juncos um, and measuring their odor and their bacteria um, and understanding the relative roles of each uh, of genetics versus bacteria in their odors. So this was a study I conducted at Mountain Lake Biological Station in Virginia. This is a very crude map of the station that I, of the study area that I drew. Um, so it's named for a lake that's on top of the mountain, which is kind of unusual. Uh, there's a hotel, a resort hotel right next to it. If you've ever seen the movie Dirty Dancing, then you know where I do my field research. Uh, that is the hotel where they filmed uh, much of Dirty Dancing. Um, this is a gravel road. It's about two miles long, just to give you a sense of the, the scale here. And the Mount Lake Biological Station is this cluster of buildings up here. And the forest is surrounded completely by forest. And that is where Ellen Ketterson has had her long-term study of juncos since the 1980s. And this was the group I joined uh, in the early 2000s for my postdoc. So here on the map, I have marked the locations of the nests that I sampled, and they are color coded, and that's a color coding I will um, show you throughout. And I also did paternity testing on all of these nests. Um, 
We know that uh, juncos are socially monogamous, but they're not always genetically monogamous. So up to 25 or 30% of all nestlings that we've ever paternity tested have turned out to be extra pair young, meaning that their father, their genetic father is not the male who raised them. Okay, so they're not always um, faithful to each other. Okay, so I, I paternity tested these guys. I had nine nests in the study. Three of those nests had only within pair young. So it was the male and female that were raising them were their parents. Two nests had only extra pair young. So their fathers were, were males from who were not their, their social fathers. And then four of the nests had mixed paternity. So they had, some of them had the, the, the social father was a genetic father, some didn't. So this gave me a nice basis for comparison to look at the role of genetics versus environment, um, because in some cases, the family members weren't related to each other or weren't as closely related to each other. Okay, so we'll start with the bacteria. Um, we found that members of the same nest had very similar bacterial communities. So here's our map on the left. And this is a graph on the right. Um, using something called the Bray-Curtis Similarity Index, and that's measuring the whole bacterial community that we looked at in each sample. Uh, the closer together things cluster, the more similar their entire community was. Um, the colors on this graph uh, match the colors on the map. So that's those are the nests these individuals came from. The filled in circles are the adults and the open circles are their nestlings. So the first thing you might notice is that there's a difference between the adults and the nestlings, right? We do see an age difference. The next thing you might notice is that with, within those age classes, the colors are clustering together. So the three nestlings from the purple nest are all very similar to each other. And the two blue nestlings, very similar to each other and so on. And that same pattern is seen in the adults. So that makes sense, right? Birds in the same nest are sharing bacteria. They're touching each other, right? It's a small, small little nest. They're hanging out, they're sharing bacteria. I also use, measured odor using the GCMS methods I showed you earlier, um, and we found the same pattern. Um, and here, my graph is a little wonky because I do have this one outlier, but overall, again, we've got the difference between the adults and the nestlings, and then within the, um, the age classes, we're seeing clustering of birds from the same nest. So birds who um, live together have similar bacteria and they smell similar. And I want to look a little more closely at those within family relationships, because remember, we've got some differences in how related some of these birds are to each other. So this is using that same measure, the Bray-Curtis Similarity Index. And just to tell you a little bit more about it, it's uh, it goes from zero to one. The closer to one it is, the more similar the two individuals you're comparing are. And so here I'm showing you the average similarity between mother offspring pairs and father offspring pairs. And so the first thing to notice is that mother offspring pairs are more similar to each other than father offspring pairs are. Okay, that makes sense because the mothers and juncos, only females sit on the nest. So the, it's the female who's sitting on the eggs to incubate them. It's the female who is um, sitting on the nestlings, brooding them to keep them warm while they're growing in their feathers. The fathers do interact with the nestlings. They help feed them, but they don't spend as much time in close contact. Oops. The next thing to notice is that uh, it's exactly the same whether the the father, the social father, is related to those nestlings or not. Nearly identical levels of similarity at their bacteria. Uh, so, relatedness here did not affect father offspring similarity, which was our first clue that you know this um, odor the odor similarity of relatives might not be entirely uh, genetically driven might be more to do with the bacteria they carry. And then finally, remember I was I had some nests that had mixed paternity, so I was able to compare full siblings versus um, half siblings. And again, similar to the father offspring results, there's no significant difference. You will notice that um, the nestlings were more similar to each other than they were to either of their parents. Again, we're talking about a little nest with birds growing up real fast pooping in the nest, right? They're all hanging out and sharing a lot of bacteria. So that's not unexpected, but it didn't matter if they were full siblings or half siblings in terms of their bacterial relatedness. 
Uh, we did some more work trying to understand the role of bacteria in producing these odors. Uh, we did two different studies, which I'll just go over real quickly here. Um, the first thing we did was we uh, injected a broad spectrum antibiotic directly into the uropigial glands of captive juncos, and we measured the uh, effects on the bacterial community and on the odors. Um, and what we found was that there was a significant effect on both and that um, the birds who received the antibiotics, which are on the red and pink side here, um, after receiving the antibiotic, those um, compounds dropped dramatically compared to birds who got a control injection of saline who are in the blue, where there is no significant change, even though it's, it looks like there's some change. Uh, statistically, that's not, not significant. And then the real kicker, I think, is that um, I went back to the field and I collected more prene oil samples. Oh, and I, this, this uh, photograph here is a scanning electron mic microscope photograph I took of prene oil. Um, and some of these round blobs here are bacteria that are in the prene oil. Uh, but I brought samples back and brought them to the lab at Wayne State University. This is Jonathan Greenberg, who was a graduate student at the time. He took these prene oil samples and he put them on Petri dishes. He cultured bacteria directly from the prene oil samples, grew up these bacterial cultures, and then we measured the odor given off by the bacteria. No bird in sight, right? Just the bacteria. And what we found was that they were reproducing the same odors um, that we saw in Junko prene oil, which I think shows pretty strongly that bacteria are the main producer of these odors in juncos. Uh, and actually it's been found in other birds now too. Uh, so that was a kind of a whirlwind tour of uh, my research, but just to summarize, um, we looked primarily at songbird preen oil odors and found that they might be important in mate assessment. So looking at um, uh, a signal of someone's individual quality and potentially uh, their MHC genotype. Uh, could be important for females to advertise their reproductive readiness. So when they are ovulating and ready to mate, they might be sending out a signal. And uh, could be important in assessing a rival's likelihood of aggression. So you might want to avoid males who are going to be aggressive towards you, and you can apparently tell based on their smell. And it's important for recognizing relatives, particularly those that you never met, uh, and avoiding mating with them. We also found that prenatal odors are produced by symbiotic bacteria, but they're also influenced by certain aspects of the bird's biology. I didn't go into great detail about this, but we have found that hormone levels, in particular testosterone, uh, very strongly affect um, the different compounds that are produced in prenatal, as well as the immune system. So, um, so we there are some links between uh, MHC genotype and those bacteria which in turn affect uh, your prenatal odor. So um, that was a lot. If you're interested in learning more, as mentioned already, I have written a book called The Secret Perfume of Birds. Uh, it is available um, either directly from Johns Hopkins University Press or on websites like Amazon. Um, I'm always happy to hear from people. Any questions you might come up with later about birds and smell, uh, there's my email address and my Twitter handle. Um, and uh, thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions.